So we now look at the last section of the nervous system. And this, we are going to talk about tumors. The tumor can be in the brain or can be in the spinal cord. So we'll talk about these two, and then my colleague will come and continue with you. So the first one we start with is the tumor that you find in the head, intracranial tumor. And depending on where the tumor is, you can have one problem or the other. So you can have the tumor affecting the meninges. It can be in various parts of the, the head or the brain. And then it can either affect adults and children. So we see what we can um, say about this as briefly as we can. And also, we did a lot about tumors in Nursing 234. You have the slice. Let's go back, review a little of the tumor and the physiology thereof. And you, tumor is tumor anywhere in the body. It's still excessive growth of cells. You can do this, you can do that. It's the same story. So you apply it to the brain. Now, it's a very common problem all over the globe. And um, in the US alone, over 17,000 people are diagnosed every year can be benign, can be malignant, tumor of every part of the head, uh, inside the head is still tumor. And you can have the tumor occurring as a primary tumor from the brain or in the head. Or it can be a tumor that is occurring somewhere and has spread to the brain. So that is a secondary tumor. So you can have breast cancer um, metastasizing to the brain or liver cancer or any other cancer going to the brain. Or you can have a, a primary brain tumor. So the, the tumor is classified from where it came from, where it's located, whether it's primary or secondary, and it's graded as such. And so I just mentioned that it can be from the breast, the lung, etc. So these are things that we know from 234. So I don't want to um, dwell so much on it. Also in 234, we also mentioned some of the factors that can cause tumor development. And these are the same here. Genetic uh, ion, uh, radiation, um, viruses, etc. Uh, so they are the same here. Now, I just mentioned that depending on where the tumor is located, you have some problems. So you have the headache, vomiting, seizures, your changes in the personality, hearing loss, etc. depending on where the tumor is located. So I've given you some, you, have, you know you have the, uh, the, the brain stem cerebellum, pituitary areas. So I've given you the location of the tumor and then the signs and symptoms that can um, be manifested. For example, if you have the tumor in the frontal loop, remember that we have different loops of the head, the frontal, occipital, can you remember the rest, parietal, what else? So go ahead and remember. These are anatomy and physiology issues, okay? So you have a, a, a tumor at the frontal loop, okay? You can have inappropriate behavior. Somebody is laughing, and then you are crying. Why are you crying? You know, you, you, what you are doing is incongruent with the context in the situation. Personality changes, inability to concentrate, impaired judgment, memory loss, etc. You see, and then when you have the um, problem at the occipital loop at the back, you know that is where um, you have your vision control. So then you can see. So the um, the slides give you the location of the tumor 
and the particular signs and symptoms that a person will have. The diagnostic investigations are similar to the brain abscess. One is uh, EEG, electroencephalography. They do that, they do the CT scan. All these are high level, very sensitive um, investigations that they do to help in proper diagnosis. And the drugs that are given, something for the pain, the steroids, something to prevent convulsion, and then something to reduce the intracranial pressure if there are. And then they can go and open up and uh, drain the pus and give you very, very, very strong antibiotics to kill the bacteria that is uh, worrying you. Um, in terms of the care after the surgery, it's almost the same as we have discussed a moment ago. You do a neurological assessment, and based on what is wrong and what the level of consciousness is, your care is planned as such. So you can't fit one patient to the other. Your neurological assessment is the basis, and then based on the particular surgery that is done and the level of responsiveness in the patient, you package your uh, care as such. So the care areas include the, the feeding, so IV fluids, the airway issues, suctioning, oxygen, etc. We want to uh, maintain elimination. We want to dress the wound aseptically, etc. So these are things that I want you to uh, revisit from time to time and then uh, move on. So we move on to the spinal cord tumors. So brain tumor or intracranial tumor. And I mentioned the tumor can be anywhere. So if you say brain tumor, it's a, very, it's a little deceptive. So intracranial tumor is better. Then we are coming to spinal cord. So the spinal cord extends from the end of the brain, so from the head to the back to your um, to where you sit, the back of your your bum is where you have the spinal, the vertebral column ending. So the spinal nerves leave from there. So from Anatomy and physiology, we know that we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And we've given you some, um, some data or some guide as in these nerves and where they are coming from is in the slide. So when we get there, I'll say a few things about it. Now, the classification of the tumor, the spinal tumor, like the brain, we classify it based on whether it's primary or secondary. So you can have tumor that is starting from the spinal cord area. And you can have tumor that is spread from another t uh, cancer to the spinal cord. I, I found um, a diagram on the next, and I pick it and put it in your slide. You can get more of these diagrams as you learn on your own. It tells, it gives you the layers of the um, the spinal um, the spinal cord cover. So when I was discussing the brain, I mentioned that the first layer is the dura. So when you look at the the diagram. The first round base is the dura, then you go to the middle one, arachnoid, and then the last one with a little pinkish is the pia. And the block in the middle is the spinal cord itself. And you can see the nerves um, leaving the spinal cord. So um, if you go on the net, you can find it and then look at it better if the slide is not very clear to you. Okay, so um, the tumor can be from the spinal cord itself or can be due to a spread. All right. Now we can also classify based on the location. So the tumor can be around the dura or between the dura and the arachnoid. So based on where it is located, 
then you can also have the name. So this one is intermedullary spinal cord tumor. So it is not in the block itself. You see where the two instruments have been separated. The tumor is just there. So it's between. Uh, so the causes, two, three, four, will give you the causes or the predisposing factor. Remember, I mentioned categorically that the main cause of cancer is unknown. All other things are predisposing factors. The fact that I'm exposed to radiation today doesn't mean that I'll get cancer tomorrow. The fact that my mother has cancer, my aunties have cancer, doesn't mean that I'll have it. It's just that I'm predisposed to it. So please keep this at the back of your mind. The etiology are more of predisposing factors. The, more, the main cause is unknown. So we have the immune system genetic. I don't want to go through it again. I just said it's for brain uh, tumor or the intracranial tumor, sorry. Now, when I have a spinal cord tumor, what are some of the things that can happen to me? You see, the spinal cord is in the vertebral bone, the vertebral column at the back. So I'll have some backache. Maybe, depending on the particular part involved, I can't walk well. The pain may radiate according to the nerve root affected. Remember, the nerves spread out and they, have, they kind of control various parts of their body. So depending on where the a tumor is and the severity of the effects then you can't work well or you have muscle weakness and sometimes you can't even get up you are just bedridden that's because of um, spinal tumor so you do similar investigations you can do um, CT scan of the spine you can do a myelogram so you can do an MRI of the spine to know how big is the tumor, which nerves is it present on, can we remove it where it is or we cannot, so that the doctors can decide on the best treatment for the patient. So with that said, we move on to the preoperative and the postoperative care. And some of you are even smiling. You see, you know what I'm going to say already. You lay the person's anxiety. You, see, you are copying and pasting. You do the neurological assessment. Um, perhaps the person may need transfusion. So I mentioned last, the last course that um, if you have a tumor surgery, the likelihood of bleeding because the tumor cells are able to establish their own blood supply and generate their own vessels. So patients with tumor surgeries, sometimes they demand that they have blood donated or blood ready. So in case of anything, the person can be transfused as an emergency to save the person's life. So we want the person to breathe well and all that. You see, it's easy, very, very easy. The person comes back from theater, you position the person appropriately, but you don't put pressure on the operator site. So you use a lot of bed accessories to maintain alignment of their body. And so the person will lie flat as much as possible because we don't want to destabilize the cerebrospinal fluid and the intracranial pressure to cause headache. So we make sure that we give total uh, nursing care on bed for the first 48, 72 hours, depending on the condition and how severe the person um, is either responding or not responding uh, one way or the other. Then when the person is able to ambulate, we, do, we tell the person not to be lifting heavy objects because the person can of course some uh, destabilization in the spinal area, especially if they have to do a laminectomy before they can get access to the, the tumor and remove it. So it's important you do that. Now when the person is going home, we want the uh, patient's relatives to be able to help the person initially until the person gradually gains his or her independence. 
So um, if you go home and there's something wrong with your movements, then we give you some assistive device to use to walk. So it can be a Zima frame, a clutch, depending on what is wrong. But usually a Zima frame so that it can, it will help them to mobilize or walk. And if there's anything, you refer to the nearest um, facility as in going for regular checks and then they can come to see the specialist from time to time. So uh, the topic number three under this session is spinal injury. You can have an injury, apart from the tumor, you can also have an injury to the spinal cord. And I was mentioning that there's a slide that breaks down the various bones and what they do, etc. So this slide and the one next, you look at it to see the number of cervical uh, bones fused together, um, the thoracic, the lumbar. So the vertebral column has these bones for the cervical area, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacrum. But remember that the coccyx, is, it looks like one bone, but there are actually four that are fused in one. So um, this is a revision from what you know already. And I also mentioned that there are 31 pairs. So the 31 pairs come from the breakdown of 8, 12, 5, 5, 1. So these are the, uh, the 31 pairs of spinal neck. Pairs means that one leaves from the right and one leaves from the left. Then we have the, the roots. We have the sensory roots, which is the dorsal horn. And then we have the ventral roots, which is the motor end. So when you talk, you hear roots of spinal cord, just know that it's sensory and motor. One helps you to feel, one helps you to move. And the one for sensory uh, is dorsal, okay? So that is why when we talk about pain, in, in nursing two, three, four, we mentioned the gait control theory and mentioned the dorsal horn of the spinal cord where the substantial gelatinosa helps in either opening or closing the gait. You have an A fiber or uh, a delta fiber. So just keep that at the back of your mind that the ventral helps in movements. And so if you have a, a tumor or an injury to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, they are going to have more sensory problems. You have an injury to the ventral, they have more of motor problems. Okay, so um, for the injury to the spinal cord, you can get these through motor accidents, a fall, um, or during sports, or at work, or when somebody stabs or shoots you. You can have these injuries. So the injury can be traumatic or can be due to bone disease, osteoporosis. And you also can have a primary or a secondary injury as a, a spinal cord problem. So if you have a problem with the spinal cord, then I mentioned that you have nerves radiating from the spinal cord. So if these are affected, you become paralyzed. Okay, you can't move. You can't breathe well, especially the cervical, thoracic. You can't breathe well and all that. Then if you have the sacral, then going to cosidial, you become incontinent. You, can't, you don't know when you are urinating or you want to empty your bowel. You may lose your sensation, your neck may be painful, etc. We took the time to give you some specific signs and symptoms relating to the cervical nerve problem, the thoracic nerve problem, and the lumbar nerve problem. So you take your t a time, go over the slides, and please read these so that you know um, the problems that a person can have. Then we also gave you some um, diagnostic tests that you can do when somebody has spinal cord injury. Um, and most of them are things that you know already. But lumbar puncture is part of these ones. Then um, the management. 
an injury is an injury. So going back to this in 333, if I'm bleeding, if I can't read well, what do you do? You see, it is important that you take this as something that is a friendly subject. Okay. If you don't read to know the critical issues, then you'll be scared. Lesson two, three, four, you have passed. Three, 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 you have passed. So four, 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 two. Bow means inshallah, you pass. So just make sure that you you understand it and and relax and just flow with the course. So the emergency treatment, you borrow from what we, we did. You know, remember I mentioned something like contrary cool injury for the chest and all that. Just go and read that one and come and apply it. So if the particular thing that is injuring the person is still there, don't remove it. Transport the person to the nearest hospital. So maintain the airway. Make sure that you control any bleeding and improve circulation as much as possible and take the person to the nearest hospital. And when you are moving a patient with spinal cord injury, you don't move the person body part by body part. You, you carry the person together as a log. So on the count of three, you move the patient to either the ambulance or the stretcher or whatever. You don't move the head and move the leg. You, you worsen the case. And for some of these patients, we give them drugs that can help um, prevent infection. If there is any intracranial pressure, you sort it out. If there's any bleeding or any clotting issues, you sort it out, etc. So um, I think that we are doing very well, and uh, I encourage you to continue to love surgery. But then your performance will be highly improved if you spend time to go to the neural ward of your hospital or the nearest hospital with the neurological ward to go and nurse a patient for a day or two just to get your skill back in terms of these things that I am discussing. So um, when the person has a, a, a spinal injury, sometimes they put a person in traction. So we have the cervical traction, and I found some pictures for you. So this is a typical patient with a um, spinal injury. And so you see that the person is in a cervical traction. And then sometimes, based on the type of injury, they have to put in special um, devices to fuse the particular parts of the, uh, the, the back that is injured. So this is a spinal fusion. So the, the, shall I say the prosthesis you see in there is what we use for um, spinal fusion. And then you can also have um, a hollow vest. It's a very hard vest that a person will wear to make sure that the bone at the back is straight so that healing can occur. So I found some picture on the net for you. You can also look for some yourself. And all these things help to um, maintain the alignment of the bone for healing to occur post of or post injury then you can also have somebody put the color on you can have the soft and the hard color so you use the hard one when you are going up and down you use the soft one when you are going to sleep okay so you can also use the color so the one key thing that can happen is what we call a spinal shock. Um, all of a sudden, reflex activities are so low, and if you don't take care, a person can go. Or after a few hours, a person regains all the reflexes again. We call it spinal shock. So you can have a shock that can you come back, or you can have a shock that is so bad that. If you don't take care, you stay in the shock forever. Another one is autonomic dysplexia. Um, if you don't treat it quickly, a person can have stroke. So you, you have to make sure that 
you do something about it. It's commonly caused by visceral distension from a distended bladder or impacted cecum, rectum. So I mentioned earlier that when you have a patient who is unconscious with very hard feces, wear a glove and remove it. If not, a person can have autonomic dysplexia. So with all that I've been saying so far, the nervous system, the anatomy and physiology of it is what scares most of us because it's complex. But the surgical component is friendly because we are talking about intracranial tumor, spinal tumor. We are talking about injuries. Okay. So we are not going to go through the circle of Willis and all those complex things that somebody else will talk about. So please don't be afraid of um, the, the neurological system. And don't ever forget your Glasgow coma scale. It's important for you to always remember it. So on this note, I wish you all the best for the rest of the uh, sessions. And uh, we are always available to give you all the necessary assistance. Thank you very much.